good morning. Always uh, good to be with you again. Thankful to be able to open God's Word with you today. Uh, we're continuing in our series in Luke's Gospel. If you're uh, new with us or you're new watching online today, this is uh, we're in Luke's Gospel. We've gotten to chapter 17. We're working our way through Luke's Gospel. At some point, we'll take a breather again and do some other things. Um, but eventually, the goal is to get through the Gospel of Luke. I want to uh, echo a couple things that Pastor Mark said earlier during uh, his announcements and during the service. My, ex- let me express my appreciation for those who helped with the, uh, the drive-in movie. He mentioned the, the wind. It was picking up. It does get a little bit windy out here on Rikers Ridge. You know, I've always um, thought it would be cool to hang glide over Rikers Ridge, and I just about had the opportunity. If I would have strapped myself to that screen, might have seen me hang gliding over over your house or something. Different view if you ever see me up there. A little windy, uh, but it, it worked out well. It was windy ahead of time. It was windy afterwards, but things kind of died down enough that we could uh, we could do that. And so that's a way for us to serve our community and be on mission. And this is uh, again the focus of the family conference. This year's family and missions. So uh, thank you, uh, Nancy and Brittany, for your testimony. Uh, really, uh, really wonderful. I, I think you know, when Mark and I were talking about and and Mary in the staff meeting this week, I'm I'm kind of a realist. Uh, you have your optimists, I guess, and you have your I prefer to call them realists, right? Not pessimists. We'll say we're realists, and so uh, our realists. I recognize sometimes when things are coming from me or from Mark, uh, probably this is what you're hearing, which maybe sounds familiar if you listen, if you watched cartoons when you were younger. Wah, 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 wah. And most of you know the Charlie Brown teacher, and sometimes I think it's that way. So it's helpful to hear from other folks who have been positively impacted by the family conferences that we've done. This will be our fourth. We took a breather. Uh, I'm glad you got something out of the one with Stephen. That was wonderful. Stephen's a, a wonderful, uh, one of my closest friends. I, I love him dearly. And um, the Lord's given me a number of f- friends. Imagine that. God's given me friends. So that has to be the Lord. Uh, but he's given me friends over the years that have come and blessed us. And um, it was encouraging to hear from, from you ladies today. So certainly you want to register. Mary, when is the deadline for registration? Next Sunday. All right. So... We need to get our registrations in for that, uh, and it will be a, a wonderful time for us to learn about what the Scriptures say about family and missions. All right, let me take us before the Lord in a time of prayer. This is typical. We do. Um, we pray silently for one minute. I know that's uh, maybe different from your experience in some other places, and, and, um, but we, we want to go before the Lord and uh, appeal for Him to work in us, and so As we do that this morning, um, we often pray uh, that the Lord would help us to focus, and uh, I want us to do that this morning. There's there's much meat in this passage, and I want us to pray for focus. So pray for yourself, and pray for the person that is on your right and on your left. And if you're sitting by yourself, and there's no one on your right and your left, take one, take like two seconds, and look around and pick two people to pray for. All right. Um, Pray for yourself and pray for two other people this morning that God would give you a focus as you listen to his word this morning. Lord, in this text today, we see much of the mercy uh, that you have 
towards fallen sinners, uh, which we are. Today, would you exercise that mercy on our behalf in granting us focus that we would have attentive minds. Uh, the, the, our lives are, are filled with all sorts of things that require our attention. Some may be mere distractions, but some may be things that legitimately need our attention. And it's easy for us to bring those into this time. Uh, as important as those things are, God, would you grant us a, a, a reprieve from the demands of life for just a, a, just a short time, just this brief time that we're together, so that we would focus on your word, not just to receive it for knowledge's sake. We do want to grow in our knowledge of Scripture, but that is so that we could be more obedient disciples of Jesus. And so help us in that today. And uh, Lord, we pray this for your honor and glory alone. In Christ's name, amen. Raise your hand if you've ever planned a surprise party for someone before. Anybody ever got it? Several of you planned a surprise party. All right, now raise your hand if someone has ever thrown a surprise party for you. A few of you have, have had that. Um, all right. How about if you've ever been to a surprise party before? All right. That's probably a lot more. There's a lot in that. Uh, I would say most people, uh, the, the show of hands, if you added those uh, cumulatively, you would see that most of us in this room have had some experience with surprise parties before. I've been fortunate in my lifetime. I've actually had several surprise parties thrown for me at different points. For instance, when I graduated high school, my, my parents and my sisters threw a big surprise party for my high school graduation. I don't really recall what they, you know, there's always some excuse they've got to give you to get you out of the house or out of the, wherever you're at, and then to get you back there. I don't remember what the particular excuse was for that one, but I do remember getting home and seeing a line of cars there in front of our house, and it was a blast. I mean, we, we had a great time with my uh, surprise high school graduation party. And then when I was about to leave my hometown for seminary the first time, uh, some friends at, our, at the church where I was a part of also threw a, a surprise party for me and actually for Brad Weldy. Uh, he was with me. Uh, we were both leaving for seminary, same, uh, same church there in Florida. And so uh, the college and singles ministry kind of conspired together and threw a surprise party for us. I was supposed to be I remember actually it was a great party. I was a little bit disappointed actually initially because I was supposed to be spending the evening with this one couple that were really good friends and I, I was all geared up for that and it was like, oh, there's a party? Oh man, but it was a good thing. It was a wonderful thing. Now, as I was preparing this, I'm reflecting on them. I'm like, wait a minute, they're throwing parties every time I'm leaving. They're getting rid of me. Oh, some party, I don't know. Maybe there's a theme there. And I could never forget my 35th uh, birthday celebration. Uh, Melinda and the older three boys 10 years ago, they threw this uh, party for me. Uh, I was working that day. It was just uh, another August hot day in Texas. Didn't really, I mean, it was just uh, whatever day of the week it was. I wasn't, I knew it was my birthday, but I didn't really care because it was just a work day. So you go off and you work or whatever, drive home, totally not expecting anything. Uh, I assume they probably remembered that it was my birthday, but opened the door, and it was like paradise. All the, our little seminary apartment that we lived in opened the door, and it's August, mind you. Christmas music is playing. The, the smell of uh, chicken parmesan in the air, Melinda's cooking, and they even strung Christmas lights. And believe it or not, my three young boys that I had at the time, they were on their best behavior for one hour. <laughs> one hour. It almost reminded me of like a, a Cinderella or one of these fairy tales, like the one hour, it's like ding, and it's like, oh, fairy tale over, and everything kind of went back to normal, and they started fighting in their bedtime routine and all that, but for, that was literally, I'm not exaggerating, that's probably the best one hour, or one of the best one hours of my life, it was just that, that one period there, it was a fantastic surprise, and that's part of what makes surprise parties so special, it's not just the party aspect, and parties are, are good most of the time, uh, even if they're planned and you know about them in advance, but to have that, that unexpected aspect of it. 
in, in the 45 years or so that I've trudged through this fallen world, my own experience is that most of the time, surprises are not good. Most of the surprises, if I sat down and I articulated all the things that I've been surprised by, most of the time, those surprises I would rather not have. So a surprise party, when people want to celebrate you in some way, there's something good about that, and there's something joyous in that. Now, in our passage this morning, we're not going to see a surprise party, uh, but we are going to see uh, some positive surprises. It, there's nothing uh, horrible here. There's no, uh, you know, like the surprises I spoke of a, mi- a minute ago. There, there, there's uh, wonderful surprises here. Uh, one of them, as the title implies, is an unexpected Thanksgiving that has nothing to do, of course, with um, the, the holiday that's coming up next month. Uh, but it's an unexpected giving of thanks from an unlikely person in an unlikely scenario. And we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but this also, this passage points us to something else uh, very unexpected if you don't know much about Jesus, because this uh, account gives us some very surprising information about the Savior. If, again, you're, if most of you, it probably won't be surprising, but try to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's reading this for the first time. There's some things that are very surprising, and they would have been, especially to people in the first century. So let's get to that first point there this morning. Unexpected Savior, part one. And again, straight from the text, Jesus heals a group of lepers. And so we pick up there in verse 11. That was the first verse in our text today. Now, the the last several weeks in our study of Luke, what we've been seeing is Jesus uh, teaching. Or he's, he's instructing, he's giving parables, he's, he's, he's talking to various groups of people, whether that's the Pharisees or his disciples, he's communicating information. But when we get to verse 11, we can see that they're on the road again, so they're on their way to Jerusalem. And we've seen this multiple times throughout uh, the, the last several chapters, beginning in the end of chapter 9, that Luke is intentionally reminding us at points that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. So the teaching time is over, now they're, they're back on the road to Jerusalem, which uh, what will happen to Jesus there, he's already made clear that he knows what's going to take place. But we're going to get into this more late in the sermon, but Jesus knew exactly what would happen when he got to Jerusalem. Jesus would be arrested on bogus charges, he would be tried in a... a, a fake trial, if you want to call it that, whatever the case may be, he, was, he would be tried uh, with the, the outcome already decided, and then he would be crucified. And so we, Jesus knew this was coming, and yet he still set his face, literally, is what it says uh, throughout Luke's gospel. He set his face towards Jerusalem, and he made his way there. We'll get back to that in just a bit. So Jesus is on this journey, and I've shared with you before, he didn't make a beeline. It's not like if I'm going uh, from, from here to, uh, say, Scottsburg or whatever, I'm not going to go down to, uh, I, I'm not going to cross the river and go all the way down towards Louisville and then come back up to Scottsburg. Normally, you wouldn't do that. You would just go straight out that way. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, he set his face towards Jerusalem, but then it's this long, meandering journey. And so he's on this journey, and at some point in this journey, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee in verse 11. So what's the deal there? Well, if you want to think about it in these terms, and it's a little bit oversimplified, but if you look at a map of the the area there in Jesus' day, there are three, three regions that are kind of prominently mentioned in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, as far as Jesus travels. So Galilee is in the north. And most of Jesus' earthly ministry was performed in the area, in the region of Galilee. That's where kind of he set up his home base. If you uh, remember, the city of Capernaum ended up kind of being his his home base on the Sea of Galilee. And so many of his miracles, he's teaching in synagogues. His hometown of Nazareth is there in the north in Galilee. To the south of Galilee, that area, uh, was Samaria. Now, Samaria was populated by a group called the Samaritans. And you've probably heard of the Samaritans before. Of course, there's the, the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then in, uh, in John chapter 4, there's the woman at the well uh, who was also a Samaritan. And so you've probably heard of this before. 
Now, some of you have heard of the origin of the Samaritans, but I'm going to go back over that briefly just so you understand kind of the context here. So who are the Samaritans? Well, the Samaritans are a group of people that are of mixed ethnic descent. And so you've got uh, earlier on, hundreds of years earlier, uh, what was Israel under Saul, David, and Solomon was split into two kingdoms. Under Solomon's son, uh, some people rebelled and the tribes split up and there were two kingdoms. There was the north Israel and the south Judah. The northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrian Empire. And when they did that, they liked to play a shell game of sorts with their conquered peoples. So they would leave some people in the land, kind of the poorest people of the land, but many of the people they would deport, and then they would take some other conquered peoples and move them over here. And so you had kind of this game almost that they're playing, really to keep them off balance was their strategy so that no one would challenge them, would rebel against them. And so what happens is in that land, which becomes later Samaria, you've got people that were left in the land, and then you've got people that were brought into the land, and they mixed. And so you end up with this group called the Samaritans. Now their religious customs, there's, there's some ethnic differences obviously, but their religious customs were also different. They developed, uh, at least in, in, uh, in the book of Second Kings, you begin to see some syncretism there where they worshipped idols that were brought in, and they also tried to worship the Lord, and there's kind of these blurring of concepts. But the Samaritans had different customs uh, than the Jews did uh, who were in the, the, the south. And so there's three regions, Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, where Jerusalem is, uh, if you look at a map in the days of Jesus. And so there's a reason why then, in John chapter 4, where we're talking about the woman at the well, uh, we see this assessment from uh, John in his gospel. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? And in a parenthetical statement there, he says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So there was friction, there was hostility, and it worked both ways. The, the, the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So you've got Jews living in Judea and Jerusalem in the south. You've obviously got some living up in Galilee, but Samaria in between is, is populated by this group that had no dealings quite often with the Jews in Jesus' day. And so Jesus is passing through this border region in between Galilee and Samaria, which undoubtedly would have places populated by folks from both regions. Uh, much like you see kind of a mixing of Indiana and Kentucky here along the river, you, see, you would see some, some mixing there of Kentuckians, I guess, and Hoosiers. There you go. So you have this, this mixing, if you will. And so Jesus enters the village there, in verse 11, uh, and in, in, or beginning of verse 12, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. Now that requires a bit of explanation as well. And so leprosy in the scriptures is not the, exactly the same, not necessarily the same as what leprosy is in modern day. And so what we know as leprosy now is a disease called Hansen's disease. But in the scriptures, when we see the word leprosy, it's usually referring to some sort of skin disorder, something that would be very evident to people around. And so you see descriptions of leprosy in, in the Bible, and that people have uh, pretty bad skin issues and whatnot that would be evident to every person around you. Now here's the deal with leprosy in the Bible. It wasn't just that you had some sort of medical issue. That would be probably traumatic enough. But it was also the social stigma that went along with it. And so if you had leprosy, you were deemed unclean, which meant that you were not allowed to associate with other people. You were isolated. You, you, you really had to to stay away from other people. You couldn't be near them because the idea was that you would contaminate others who would come uh, into contact with you. And so that would explain then why this group of ten lepers is standing at a distance. Right? They don't come up to Jesus. They don't walk up to Him. They don't approach Him and say, hey, please, can you heal me? They don't do that. It, to do that would be unthinkable. And so they keep their distance and they call out to Him, with a loud voice. They stood at a distance. They raised their voices because they had to, again, because they were at a distance, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
Now, how did Jesus respond to this group that's calling out to him? Now, here's where the unexpected part begins, when we're talking about the unexpected Savior. I want us to stop for a minute and think about ways that Jesus could have responded. Not how he did respond, and we're going to see that. I'm not uh, changing the Bible, but I'm just saying, let's think for a moment about ways that Jesus could have responded in the text. One, he could have said... Guys, leave me alone. I don't have time for you. Or maybe even ignored them. He could have just, I mean, it's pretty evident from the Gospels that Jesus was a very popular person. Every time he goes out in public, people, once the word has gotten out who Jesus is, uh, that he, this guy can heal and he's an amazing teacher, people say he's a prophet. Every time he went out, people are just swarming around him. They're flocking to him. In fact, there's the incident with the, the woman with the, the hemorrhage or the issue of blood where people are pressing in on him and Jesus says, who touched me? And I believe it was Simon Peter. He said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. And so if that type of uh, celebrity, if you will, in the first century, people are, are flocking to Jesus, it would have been very easy for him to say, sorry, fellas, don't have time, or even just to ignore them. But he doesn't do that. Or... He could have done what some in Jesus' day, uh, apparently this was their mindset, and that is to blame them for their own plight, as if their leprosy was directly a result of their sin. We see that type of thinking in Job, in the book of Job. We also see it with the man born blind in John's gospel. The disciples ask, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus corrects that way of thinking. But Jesus could have been like that and said, Oh, you're getting what you deserve with your leprosy. But of course, he did not do that because Jesus knew that was not the case. He didn't blame them for their suffering. Or Jesus could have done what some would do. He could have reacted with fear. Stay back! Don't get any closer! I don't want to even have anything to do. I I can see you have leprosy, and that's not just one of you. There's a group of you. I don't want anything what you've got. You guys stay way back. He could have done that. But again, he did not do that. So what did he do? Well, look at the verse. Uh, He said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Essentially what Jesus did is he healed them. Okay, But the way that he did it perhaps requires some explanation. Why did he tell them to go and show themselves to the priest? Well, actually what Jesus is doing is he's referencing something from the Old Testament law. It's too long for us to look at this morning. If you're taking notes, you may want to write down Leviticus 13 and 14. Leviticus 13 and 14 give procedures for being uh, cleared, if you will, or pronounced clean when you had some sort of leprosy. And in those situations, and it gives several, there's all kind of if you ever wondered all the different ways like things can break out on your skin from an ancient perspective, read Leviticus 13 and you're going to see, well, if you have this kind of sore with this kind of hair growing out of it, and whether it's like, whoa, man, didn't realize there were all these different types of things you could have. In those, in those passages there in Leviticus 13 and 14, the priest's role is to be the assessor, the one who looks at the person and says, you are clean or you are unclean. So for them, in Jesus telling them, go and see the priest, he's effectively telling them that he's going to clean, cleanse them. They're going to go, they're going to be cleansed, and then the priest will be able to give the official pronouncement, yes, you are clean. And so Jesus sends them out, they obey, and as they obey his directive, in fact, the group of lepers becomes a group of former lepers. The end of verse 14, as they were going, they were cleansed. Now, a number of Bible scholars point out that this very much mirrors the experience of Naaman or Naaman, really is the easier way to say it, in the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5, we have this account of Naaman, who is a, a foreign, he's a foreigner, much like with the Samaritan, uh, and he's, he's, uh, he comes and he has leprosy, and the prophet Elisha tells him, go and dip in the Jordan River seven times. And so he doesn't come out and, you know, lay his hands on him or do anything. He says, go do this and you'll be cleansed. And he does. And he's cleansed. Uh, After some wrangling, if you will, he's not very happy about what he was told. You can read that in 2 Kings 5. 
Why do I bring that up? Because several times we've seen this. It's been a little while in our study of Luke, but several times in our study of Luke, we've seen that Luke is intentionally paralleling the ministry of Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry, with the ministries of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. And in doing that, but I mean, why did he choose this? Why did Luke choose this particular miracle, right? Why did he choose to do that? Uh, John's Gospel, at the end of John's Gospel, it tells us that uh, there's no way you could record all the things that Jesus did. That all the books in the world wouldn't hold this. Jesus did so much. So the Gospel writers intentionally chose to include particular incidents, but there were many more. So why did Luke choose to include this? I think Luke is trying to tell us something. That Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament were shadows of what was to come. And Jesus is the, the reality. He's the fulfillment of it. They're pointing us to Jesus. Elisha and Elijah were great men of God. If you read the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings in the Old Testament, you'll see they did powerful miracles. But they are a shadow of what Jesus actually did. Because they called on the power of God, and these things were done. Jesus is God in human flesh, and He did these mighty miracles. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. He is a prophet and more. And so this points us to the reality of the greatness of Jesus. There's no one like Jesus. Well, we're going to come back to that unexpected Savior in just a bit, but I want us to get to the next point this morning, and that is the unexpected thanksgiving. There's an unexpected thanksgiving, and that is that a Samaritan, former leper, because at that point he used to be a leper and he's not anymore, praises Jesus. You know, uh, I, I, most of you know I'm a Christmas nut. I even referred to that early in the, earlier in the sermon. One of the things that you see continually around Christmas time, you see these uh, commercials for Christmas type stuff. And uh, you see these, almost every year they have some kind of car commercial. Here's the scenario. It's Christmas morning. Someone comes out and in their driveway is their Christmas gift. They've got the, the brand new car or whatever with the, the big ribbon on it. And that is the Christmas gift. Just out of curiosity. Has anybody ever actually had that happen to them before? No hands. All right, I have not either. Again, the realist in me, sometimes when I see those, I think, congratulations, Merry Christmas, now you've got a massive car payment. I just doesn't really seem that appealing. However, if it was paid in full, hey, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But that, as amazing as that would be to get a brand new car or truck on Christmas morning, which would, again, be amazing, that pales. I mean, it's, it's like not even a fraction of a percentage point compared to what we see that Jesus did in this text for this Samaritan man and the, and the other nine lepers. I told you earlier that leprosy was not just a medical condition. Now that would be difficult enough if that's all it was. And those of you who have dealt with or, or are currently dealing with chronic health conditions understand that it would be an amazingly wonderful thing if somehow you woke up one morning and all those were gone. Whatever chronic health conditions you have, they're gone that would be unbelievably amazing. Way better than the new car at Christmas. However, leprosy was not just a chronic health problem. Leprosy also involved social isolation. It also involved public shame. Oh, especially with the thinking that I told you about earlier, where people are directly associating your problems with sin that they assume you have. Oh, it's the leprous man. That's a great sinner. And so there's public shame involved with this. But another aspect of it is that there's this financial disaster. You can't work. How are you going to work a job when you can't be in contact with anybody? You've basically been sidelined, and so you are now at the mercy of others. You are a permanent beggar. You, there is nothing that you can do uh, that would actually people would accept if they knew that you were a leper. One, because they don't want to be contaminated by whatever you're doing. You can't touch them. You can't work with them. And if you're touching other things, maybe they're assuming that's unclean. You're isolated. This is bad. This is worse than bad. This is worstest. I know that's not a real word, right? The worstest. 
And so this is horrible. The only other people that you could hang out with were other lepers. That, that's why there's 10 of them. They can band together, right? They're not going to contaminate each other. But you can't be around anyone else except these lepers. And so th- this is a terrible life that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. And so if this was such a wonderful thing, which it was that Jesus did for this group of 10, then you might have expected that they would say thank you, right? That they would be grateful. So why am I saying that this is an unexpected Thanksgiving? Well, for at least a couple of reasons. One, it's unexpected because of the one who is giving thanks. Out of this group of 10, apparently at least one of them was a Samaritan. Now, we don't know the percentages. Maybe it was one Samaritan, nine Jews, or nine uh, Samaritans, one Jew. But I, I tend to think, and most commentators believe, that the bulk of it was not Samaritans. That this guy was probably the only one, or maybe there were just a couple. And so for it to be this one, that's the one that comes back, is quite surprising. Uh, Samaritans and Jews were not best buds. They were, they were far from it. And so the fact that it is this one that comes back and gives thanks is, is stunning. It's unexpected uh, because, again, you would have to put aside some former attitudes that were probably there, some prejudices and other things that were already there for you to come and humble yourself in that way. Now, again, zooming out just a bit and looking at Luke, we're try- part of what we're trying to do is learn Luke's gospel. And this is a consistent theme throughout Luke that is foreshadowing what's to come. Jesus in his earthly ministry at specific points very clearly ministered to non-Jews. He was ministering to Samaritans, to other Gentiles, and, and we see that w- which is going to explode in the book of Acts. Right In the book of Acts, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost. And the book of Acts follows that progression and the ministry, the gospel, goes out to the Gentiles. And so we're seeing clues of that here. So it's unexpected because of the one who's giving thanks. But apparently it's also unexpected because I guess it's just not that common. What percentage of people that were healed gave thanks? It's a math quiz. Somebody help me out. I already know the answer. What's the percentage of people that gave thanks? 10%. One-tenth. 10%. So that tells me that the overwhelming majority of people did not do that. And yet here's one who did. And so again, it's unexpected. So why is it that this particular man returned to give thanks and not the others? Well, the last part, the remaining verses are going to show us that something else happened to this man besides being cleansed from leprosy. And that's our last point this morning. Unexpected Savior Part 2. Jesus saves a sinner who puts his faith in him. Jesus saves a sinner who puts his faith in him. Verses 17 and 18 draw attention to the fact uh, that the other nine did not return like the Samaritan man did. And so Jesus asked this series of, of rhetorical questions. He says, were there not ten cleansed? Of course, he knew the answer to that. But the nine, where are they? Again, another rhetorical question. Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And so Jesus is is contrasting this. I, I want us to think about it this way for a minute. The passage would make sense if verses 17 and 18 were not in there. If Luke went from verse 16... And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. And let's say Luke decided to go ahead and say verse 19, and he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. That would make sense from the storyline. But there's, there's something that Luke is trying to convey to us when Jesus is asking this series of rhetorical questions. And what Jesus is doing is he's drawing a big distinction between the nine and the one. Something is different about the nine and the one. What is it that is different? Well, the answer to that is found in verse 19. Uh, Verse 19 in the New American Standard reads this way, and he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. Now normally, the New American Standard is one of the most literal modern Bible translations. That's why I started using it about 20 years ago when I was taking Greek and Hebrew in seminary. But in this particular instance, the translators of the New American Standard did not go the super literal route. 
Um, and they, I'm sure they had their reasons for doing that. I'm not trying to undermine your, your uh, confidence in the, this particular translation. No, that's not my point. Uh, or another translation that you're using. If you have the New American Standard and you have a footnote there, you're going to see that it says literally has saved you. So what Jesus actually is saying uh, in the most literal uh, rendition of it is this. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. The only modern translation I could find that used that is the CSB. But it says your faith has saved you. And so that the, the reason I'm bringing this up is I believe that points to primarily the difference between the one and the nine. He doesn't say that about the nine. The nine had some measure of faith to obey what Jesus had initially commanded, right? They, he could have said, go and show yourselves to the priests, and the nine could have been like, whatever, I'm not doing that. No, they did. They, so they got as a group, hey, let's go, fellas. And so they walk off, and as they're going to the priests, they're cleansed. So there's some measure of faith, and, and the Lord heals them in that way. But apparently, those other nine are satisfied with getting something from Jesus and calling it good. Hey, I'll take it. Good stuff. And they just go along their merry way. Doesn't change things moving forward. It changes how they live, obviously, because they don't have to live like lepers anymore. But internally, spiritually, they're not really changed. But that's not the case with the Samaritan. The Samaritan, when he realizes that he's been cleansed, He's moved with gratitude, and he stops in his tracks, and he says, oh, wait a minute, and he turns around, he, he exclaims with a loud voice, which you think about it, he says he's glorifying God with a loud voice. I wonder what that sounded like. If that's me, and who knows how long they lived as lepers, but I'm guessing it was probably for a long time. If you had years of chronic health problems that came with social isolation, public shame and f like fiscal disaster when you when you're walking and all of a sudden you realize you're cleansed i think glorifying god with a loud voice sound like yes <laughs> would it not i i mean I, sanctified imagination right maybe it didn't sound like that maybe i don't know maybe explain something in aramaic or something i don't know but i don't think he was like oh that was nice Wow, that's great. I think he was overjoyed. Yes, yes! That's how you would be. That's how I would. If you're not, you need to get your ticker checked or something. That, that is how uh, his whole life is changed. Everything is different. I, I don't have to go isolate from everybody now. I don't have to beg people for scraps. I don't have to do all that. I can work with my hands. I can hug someone. I can be in people's lives again. After all this time, Jesus came and made me well. And so he glorifies God. Praise God! And he comes back and he falls on his face and he gives thanks. Why did he do that and the others not do that? My friend, the difference is that this man had saving faith. Something touched him. Some, by God's grace, there was a connection made, not just in his mind, but in his heart, that this one, Jesus, was different. And this one, this is the one, this is the one that I need to put my faith in. And so his response is he worships, he falls before him, and he gives thanks. He was touched. He was changed, friends. The evidence of the difference between this man and the nine is in the way that he saw and approached Jesus. Jesus was the object of his faith. And my friends, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Now that, that brings us back to the beginning of the passage. I told you I'd come back to this later. Verse 11 very beginning says while he was on the way to Jerusalem what, 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 what was he going to Jerusalem for again you want to see the sights it's a nice tourist destination Jesus is going to go and he's going to enjoy the best of life in Jerusalem is that why he was going to Jerusalem 
Absolutely not. He's already told us multiple times in the Gospel of Luke exactly what was going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And my friends, this man was on the right track, this Samaritan, because he put his faith in Jesus, and Jesus was literally on his way to accomplish not just his salvation, but yours too and mine if you're, you have your faith in Jesus. My friend, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to be arrested crucified, arrested, not because of some wrongdoing on Jesus' part. And the Bible's clear that Jesus is sinless. He committed no crime. He was arrested under false accusations. He was literally tortured and killed, not because he did anything wrong, but for our sin. And then he died and he rose again. And my friend, it is only by faith in him that not just the Samaritan, but sinners like you and like me can be saved today. Today. So maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. and You've never had your life transformed in that way. My friend, I would love to talk and pray with you. I would, there would be no greater joy in my life than to, to, for one sinner to point another to the Savior. I would love to do that. But I also recognize that uh, maybe you're here this morning and you know Jesus, because I would assume uh, many, most of you do. But perhaps you're realizing that your love for Christ and your gratitude towards Him are not what they should be. But my friend, if that's you, let me quickly say this morning that I, I, I understand that. I do. I wish that I could say that the reaction I just had a few moments ago to the Samaritan or that the Samaritan had, in my own mind anyway, is the way that I always feel about my faith in Christ, about Jesus. I wish that I could say that that was always the case, but friends, it's not, and it's probably not in your life as well. Life in a fallen world can be very, very, very difficult, especially in prolonged seasons of suffering or after tragic circumstances. My friends, life is hard in a fallen world, and many times, we're not feeling that way, and I understand that. If that is you today, let me encourage you, friend, that Jesus has compassion on sinners. Jesus has compassion. right? Jesus, I, I haven't really talked much about that, but with the, the group of ten, uh, the reason, in part, that Jesus did not say, I'm too busy today, or get back, I don't want to be contaminated by you, is because he had compassion on them. He loved them, and so he was willing to engage them, even if it was, in this case, verbally, to send them off and to heal them. Jesus loves sinners. I don't want to, I want to be careful, not, this is an actual historical event, uh, so I don't want, I want to be careful about allegorizing it, but at the end of the day, in one sense, we are all, uh, spiritually speaking, foreigners like this Samaritan because of our sin. And yet Jesus has compassion on us. It didn't stop Jesus from going to the cross for us. And it did not stop Jesus from healing the Samaritan leper. He is a compassionate Savior. And so if this is you this morning, and you're here and you're saying, Pastor Kevin, I get what you're saying, and it sounds really nice in kind of a perfect world, but you don't understand my life. I don't, I don't feel that joy or that gratitude that you're speaking of. Maybe you and maybe me, we simply need to recall how wonderful Jesus is. Maybe we just need to, to, to focus on that for a while. How amazing and wonderful the Savior is. You know, one of the things I think of the enemy's strategies in our world, and I mentioned it during the, uh, the prayer time at the beginning of the sermon, is for us to constantly be distracted. Now, that happens through various ways. Some of it is entertainment and whatnot. I, I get that, and I think those things sometimes can go overboard, whatever the case may be, your particular form of entertainment. But some of it is just the weight of the, the load that we carry in this world. There are constantly things that are pulling at us. And it's difficult for us to set aside any sort of time or thought energy or anything to actually focus and meditate on how wonderful Jesus actually is. And yet, sadly, ironically, that is the antidote many times to a lot of the difficulties that we deal with 
in our own soul, my friend. We often don't feel like worshiping Jesus. We don't feel like giving thanks to him. But sometimes we need to take proactive steps to cultivate worship in our hearts. Proactive steps. Don't, 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 don't only do things because you feel like them. And I realize very quickly in evangelical circles that gets into duty, which is like a, like a curse word or something. But uh, ultimately, my point is, sometimes, whether we feel like it or not, we need to open God's word and be in it. Sometimes, whether we feel like it or not, we need to pray and call out to the Lord. Sometimes we need to surround ourselves with other believers, whether we feel like it or not, who can point us to Jesus. Sometimes we need to uh, take in some worship music. I've shared with you before uh, that one of the things I do, uh, even on Sunday mornings, is put some worship music on because it helps focus my heart and my mind. And I realize our tastes in music are probably not the same, but thankfully, in God's kindness, there are a variety of styles of music that all point us to Jesus. And so maybe for you, that's Southern gospel. Maybe for you, it's some other form of Christian music or old hymns or something contemporary. But my friends, that is, it, there's something special about that that helps to capture and refocus our hearts and our minds. And it is an intentional uh, effort at times to do that. And so my point is this. My point is, sometimes it's very helpful for us to be intentional about seeing how great our Savior is. About remembering how wonderful He is in a general sense and how wonderful He has been to me. And when we do that, uh, it's almost like the old hymn. I don't have this in my notes, but it just makes me think of, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. What's the next line? And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The hymn writer understood something of what I'm trying to convey to you today. That there is a time for us to turn our focus intentionally to the Lord Jesus. And when we do this, just like this Samaritan man, we begin to remember the things that God has done for us. We remember the love that God has for us and the demonstration of that love in the cross of Christ. And when we begin to see those things and, it's, and begin to remember how God brought us to the point where we heard the gospel, the circumstances that Jesus puts you in, so that you would hear the gospel and then by his kindness you drew you to repentance, opened your heart, you received the gospel, and he's been with you every step of the way, proving once again the truth of the statement in the book of Hebrews that he will never leave or forsake us. And when we remember how, our, our sin and we see that I, I don't deserve that, I'm just an unworthy servant like last week's text, and we meditate on how wonderful and how great our Savior is, and our heart wells up, the Lord begins to to do something transformative there. And once again, we taste and see that the Lord is good. There's a sweetness in knowing Christ. And we're refreshed. It's like an oasis in the desert. Uh, I lived in the desert. Um, I no longer live in the desert. And there's a, I don't really want to go back and live in the desert again. It's not my favorite uh, there are some wonderful things about hiking and whatnot, but in general, when you're in the desert, my friend, you're parched. You're high. It's just ah. And sometimes you just need a cold drink of water or whatever this uh, emergency, whatever I'm drinking right now, because you're parched, my friend. A passage like this this, this morning. If we will take the time to read it and not just breeze over it, but actually chew on it and see how wonderful Jesus is, it can be like a balm to our soul because we see that this great, amazing Savior is so compassionate and he loves sinners. And my friends, he makes a difference in our lives. If we will catch a fresh glimpse of that, my friend, it can do wonders for the day-to-day -day grind that we face. Let us meditate 
in the glory of Jesus and his love for us and see what God will do in our lives as individuals and as a church. Let's pray. God, you are amazing. And uh, this testimony of your love for us that we see here in this passage this morning may just be the, 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 the bomb that someone sitting here today needs. Life is hard, Lord. And like the psalmist, sometimes we cry out to you, How long, O Lord? The agony of our souls is real. And yet, a passage like this reminds us that here, here was one who had an extreme agony of soul, this Samaritan, and he found hope in Jesus. Lord, would you grant that hope today, uh, even to one of your children, someone who already knows Jesus, who's, who's experiencing a time of struggle and difficulty this morning, by your kindness, would you refresh this one? And for another who perhaps never has known that hope, thank you that you're still able to save. And so, Lord, would you do a work in that one's life today? For your honor and glory alone, we pray this in Jesus' name.